we're going to talk about um, care of patients with respiratory emergencies. First one is a pulmonary embolism, or a PE. We, um, we run into that uh, quite often. This is um, when somebody has a DVT. We always look for those um, deep vein thrombosis. And what concerns us and why we try to get those dissolved with blood thinners as quick as possible is we do not want it to become a pulmonary embolism when basically it travels. It can travel and basically block off the um, uh, arteries into the lungs. And this is potentially fatal. Um, so um, here's an example picture of a pulmonary embolism. And it's pulmonary embolism with infarction, meaning it is blocking the blood flow, blocking oxygen, and tissue is dying. Risk factors for PE is prolonged immobilization. That would be, of course, like your surgery patients that are bedridden. This is why we try to get people up as soon as possible, get them up and walking, getting them moving. Um, People that take long flights, like overseas international flights, they're advised to get up and walk around some during the flight, not to sit still the whole time because that will put them at risk of getting a DVT, which of course can then uh, progress to a PE. Um, other things, pregnancy, obesity, advancing age, um, cancer is, it's, I don't see it on here, but uh, cancer, for some reason cancer makes blood um, thicker and sticky and uh, people with cancer have a major risk of um, developing a PE. Of course, our patients are um, always advised to stop smoking, to lose weight, become active. If they're traveling, they need to drink plenty of water. They need to change positions often, not cross their legs. They need to get up and move around at least for five minutes of every hour. Some things that we would look for um, would be some respiratory um, issues, um, physical assessments like with respiratory, you would hear diminished breath sounds. Um, they'll feel very anxious. They get very anxious. Whenever people start having respiratory issues, they get very restless and very anxious. Um, think about that. If you have a patient that's suddenly becoming very anxious or restless and wanting to get up and move around, think respiratory. Um, my father passed away because he was having respiratory issues and was anxious and restless trying to get up. And in the hospital, they pretty much have forced him to lay down and he, uh, he passed away. So make sure you put that in the back of your mind that that could be a cause. I'm not saying it is a cause all the time, but it can be. Um, there are some um, blood work that can look for this. Um, D-dimer is a big one that um, they look for, um, can determine um, uh, for like a PE. And of course, imaging a CT, that's a pretty, uh, pretty standard. Um, all right, that was it for PE. Going on to acute respiratory failure. This is, look at that O2 less than 60. This is definitely acute respiratory failure, right? Could be from the ventilator failing. It could be an oxygenation failure just in, within the body, or it could be a combination of the two. Um, of course, difficulty breathing. They um, don't want to lay flat. They always want to sit up. Uh, that tripod position is always classic for respiratory failure when people want to sit up and like lean forward. Um, you want to, uh, of course, check the ABGs, look again for that restlessness and agitation. Oxygen therapy, drug therapy, position of comfort. Um, when someone is in acute respiratory failure or in acute respiratory distress syndrome, ARDS, which we'll talk about next, I believe, um, prone, put them in a prone position, proning. It's basically putting them on their stomach. Um, that puts the lungs in the most natural position and it's the um, best way for the lungs to expand. So uh, proning is definitely a thing. Put them in that position to help them breathe. There's also even beds. Um, they're like, they're rotating beds. I've honestly, I've never seen one in real life. I've only read about them or seen videos, but um, apparently they're very, very expensive, which is probably why I haven't seen them in, in any facility. But it reminds me of putting a person on like a rotisserie. Um, it's a bed that just very, very slowly 
I mean, not not to the point where they're going to get dizzy. It's very slowly, but it turns very slowly, but it basically turns them all the way around. They're all strapped in so they can even be turned. This gets the blood moving, the blood flowing, and is honestly has had really, really good results. Okay, here's the ARDS that I was talking about. This is when hypoxemia uh, persists even when 100% oxygen is given. So um, this is when you are going to be, um, of course, doing everything you can, given the oxygen, given the drug therapy, putting them in that prone position. Um, this is what happened with a lot of people that had COVID. They went into ARDS, sepsis become septic when you pay, basically infection goes all throughout the bloodstream and ultimately can turn into multi-organ um, um, multi-organ oh shoot what is it mods basic m dysfunction multi-organ dysfunction where all the organs start shutting down somebody becomes septic you've got about 24 hours to turn them around or um, the chances of them passing away is is very very high Um, look at here, ARDS mortality rate estimated at 46%. Um, again, there you're going to have your um, rapid breathing. They're going to be very noisy respirations. They're going to be um, cyanotic, um, pale. Um, they are going to have, um, you'll need to have like sputum cultures done. You'll need to do chest x-rays and ECG. And of course, you need to be um, intubated, um, drug, fluid therapy, and nutrition therapy. It's at that point, it's it's completely supporting the body. Here's an um, ET tube placement. Those are um, examples of what some ET tubes look like. There's different size tubes. Um, and then the correct placement. It's, it's kind of tricky. You can see there that esophagus and trachea are right next to each other. And that is a um, that is an issue of... Um, place in the ET to make sure that it's in the trachea and not the esophagus. I did a practice ET um, placement one time, well not one time, but a couple times, but it was in a, a class, I think in nursing school, and I consistently got it into the esophagus. So it's, uh, it's a little tricky. When you do put in an ET tube, um, verify the tube placement. There's um, there's little, um, there's different ways, and I know that the ET tube that I had experimented with, played with, had a um, a little um, color changing mechanism on it that would measure the carbon dioxide that was being exhaled, and it would change colors. And you wanted that because that showed that the person was exhaling and that you had the tube placed in the trachea. Chest X-ray, of course, would be a pretty much a, um, a gold standard looking for that placement. Uh, mechanical ventilation, there's different types of controls on your ventilator. There's a, a lot of them that will do all the work for the patient, completely breathes for them. There's others that are like assisted where the patient's breathing on their own, but if they're not taking enough breaths, the machine will, will kick in and breathe for them. Um, the biggest thing that I can say about ventilators is um, there is special training. If you work in an ICU, you have to have some special training for vents, um, but work with your respiratory therapy therapist. My niece is a respiratory therapist, and she's like very cranky about that. She's always like, ah, you nurses messing with my vents. Don't touch my vent. So, you know, that's uh, the easy way out is to, uh, if you have any questions about your vent, call your respiratory therapist. Let them come mess with it because otherwise they'll bite your head off. Just kidding. They may not. I just know that this is what I was I was told by my uh, RT niece. Um, when you have a ventilator issue, always look at your patient first. Matter of fact, not even ventilator, all machines. Always look at your patient first. Um, you know, you've got somebody on telly and it's saying that this patient's now in VTAC. Look at your patient. I've had one tell me that uh, the, the telly saying a patient was in VTAC. I was at the nurse's station, ran in there, hauling butt in there, patients sitting up and um, just acting fine. And I scared the crap out of him because I came running in, skidding in, you know, and he's like, what, what, what's going on? And it was, it was, it was the machine was not correct. So um, pay attention to your patient. 
Um, when extubating a patient, you want to hyperoxygenate them, um, thoroughly suction suction them. Um, the ET it has a little um, little uh, they call it a cuff, but it's it's like when you put in a foley and you have to inflate it. Well, the same thing is with the ET tube. It's it's inflated the same thing and you, same way. And you put a, a, a syringe and you pull it out. Um, like the fluid that it blows up that little balloon or whatever to hold it in place, you would want to deflate that, and then it just basically you pull it out, and you want to take it out fairly quickly, um, have the patient um, cough, and then continue the oxygen with either face mask or nasal cannula, and then just keep an eye on them, make sure that they're not going back into respiratory distress. All right, chest trauma. Chest trauma says about 50% of deaths. Um, this is from traumatic injuries. This could be car accidents. It could be from contact sports, could be from a, a fall. Um, different types of chest trauma, pulmonary contusion, rib fractures, flail chest, pneumothorax, hemothorax, or tension pneumothorax. Pulmonary contusion, um, that is again where um, could be from uh, trauma um, to the chest and it's damaging the tissues of the lung. It could be asymptomatic at first, but then they suddenly start going into respiratory failure. They're gonna have decreased breath sounds, crackles, wheezes, and basically the big thing is to just support them with oxygenation. A rib fracture, um, again, this is could be from uh, uh, trauma. Um, sometimes they may need to be have some binding um, but if it's just one rib fracture, a lot of times uh, we don't do anything. We just um, tell them to, you know, be careful, watch, you know, how, you know, make sure that they don't, uh, the patient doesn't um, do any type of activities that could cause further damage, which honestly, they're going to be in so much pain, they're not going to want to. So the big, big thing that we do is just pain management. Flail chest. The flail chest is when um, there's, um, again, it's, it's traumatic injury. Now that, um, that the lung, you can see here, it's not inflating uh, properly. It's usually caused by a break of the ribs. It's usually two or more ribs broken in two or more places. So those ribs are there for protection for the lungs, but it also kind of gives it a little structure. So the, the lungs are, are there within the chest cavity. Well, now you've got a um, rib fracture, like I said, two, a minimum of two rib fractures in two or more places. Um, one of the um, classic um, signs of this is what they call paradoxical breathing, which means typically we know that when you breathe out, your your lungs get smaller, right? And when you breathe in, your lungs get larger. Paradoxical means it's the opposite. So that's kind of weird. And you can see that um, here, this first uh, A, picture on A, that's a normal. Uh, B is when they are um, breathing out. That's their breathing out. And you can see paradoxic motion, meaning that the lungs actually look bigger. Um, inspiration is on C. And you can see that that one section that the lung actually sucks in. And then D is on expiration. You can see that the unstable area, it balloons out. So you can see where that rib fracture would have been where the lung is, is sucking in or it's ballooning out. Um, and then we have a tension pneumothorax, and that is basically where the lung space is, there's a lot of air in there, and the lung cannot expand because the air is in the way. It's, it's not allowing it to expand. It could be also um, a, um, uh, a hemothorax, uh, which it's, it's blood. It could be all blood filled there. It could all be full of blood, not letting it expand, or it could be air. Of course, that's when you would put in the chest tube, and that point of that chest tube would be to pull out the air or the blood so that the lung can expand. Um, and I think that's it. So, um, um, if any questions, uh, just let me know. Thank you.